Okay, so this afternoon I'm going to do something a little different on my YouTube channel. It is the middle of winter time and the bees are doing absolutely nothing but trying to hold their own in clusters inside the beehives. So, uh, if you've been watching my channel, you might have noticed that I have uh, a very eclectic group of videos going out right now because I do product reviews. I'm a photographer, so I do photographic equipment related reviews and things like that. So some people that are here for the honeybees um, may be wondering why I'm not showing anything about bees. Well, they're just not doing anything. Yesterday I went out and took my thermal camera and uh, got a heat print off of each of the colonies. So I know that they're doing well and uh, I know that they're inside their colonies, that they're alive and they're kind of low in the colony, so I know that they haven't consumed all of their food. So what I thought I would do to satisfy those who are still asking lots of questions about beekeeping is I would uh, bring up uh, the most frequently asked questions I receive through YouTube and other social media like my Facebook page, Fred's Fine Fowl Facebook. And uh, people ask lots of questions about bees. So I thought instead of sitting down and typing out these answers through the list in the video descriptions and the responses down in video comment sections, I'm just going to take the top, in this case now, the top 18 questions that I've received. So I'll try to get through it pretty quick. I know some people don't like it when I talk slow or when my videos are drawn out because sometimes I just kind of get lost in videoing bees and their activities and whatever else. But today I'm going to try to get through the points kind of fast. Now these are in no particular order. All right. So and they may be from beginning beekeepers that are just thinking about what they need to do to start out and that's great. And uh, others are more seasoned beekeepers that have been doing it for many years, but they have questions about the flow hive, which is still relatively new. I'm in my fourth year with the uh, flow hive. I'm in my 12th year of beekeeping. So, the first question, where to get bees, and will they just come to my hive? Now that's a funny question. Some people think uh, it's like a bird box. You know, if I put out a bluebird box and I make it to the right specifications and put it on a post in the right environment, the bluebirds will inhabit it, and they do. So will honeybees just automatically move into a bee box if you buy one and put it out in your bee yard? And this question most frequently comes uh, from people who have just bought a flow hive. So it's interesting to me that you would buy a beehive without first understanding where the bees come from and how you obtain bees. So we're also going to answer some of those questions here too. But it is possible that you could set on an empty beehive, just a brood box with the bottom board, with the cover, the inner cover, and you could put frames in it, and you could actually put a swarm lure in there. And you could attract a swarm in spring. Or at some time during the year, if you've got somebody nearby that has a lot of bees and they're looking for places to live, they might move into it, but the chances are slim to none. Because that box has never been inhabited by bees before. You could put Swarm Commander in there and hope and put it at the right height and in the right environment to attract those bees. But they will not come, in general, voluntarily to your beehive. So, I recommend you buy bees, just like everyone else. But more importantly, a question like that comes from someone who's bought a beehive and hasn't taken the time to learn about the bees. So please... Join a beekeeper association or something and learn more about the bees and then uh, find out how you can obtain them. Maybe someone will donate a, donate a swarm or they will give you some nukes, nucleus bees in brood frame. Those are ready to go. Or you could buy packaged bees, but you're going to want to get the assistance of somebody who knows what they're doing for that. Number two, how much honey for winter and what do you save? Okay, if you've been looking at my beehives, I live in the northeastern United States along the Great Lakes region and we're in the snow belt. Right now it's 10 degrees outside and we have snow everywhere. So my bees, depending on the size of the colony and how many bees are in it and their consumption rate, I save anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds of honey. So then some people might say, well you have a flow hive so you just take all the honey right off, right? And you don't leave anything for the bees. I mean that's what flow hive people do. No, it's, it's not what we do. Beekeeping has not changed just because you have flow hives. The principles are the same. The bees have to be fed. I'm not in this to collect the honey. It just happens to be something that I do for kicks. So I'll set up a brood box on the flow hive. That gets filled up. Then you'll notice if you look at my videos of my bee yard that there are medium supers out there. A medium super is a shallow box. And that will be full of honey first. Then you'll see the flow hive super put on top of that. 
Then once I draw off the honey from the flow hives, I leave the honey in that medium super and whatever is in the brood box. That's their winter resource. So I never take away everything. There's only one hive in my colony, in my apiary out there, one bee colony is being fed. All the rest are living off of 50 to 100 pounds of stored honey that's already in the colony. So that's how much I save because I live in the cold part of the United States. If you live in a southern climate or you live in an area that's more temperate or, you know, if it's warm year round and there's resources year round, you can probably take more and save less and get your bees through. And again, the consumption rate is not all the same. Some people have hive scales to show what the uh, hive weighs and how much they might be consuming. If it starts getting really light, then they know they have to feed them. My goal is not to have to feed my bees. Third question. Remove flow frames and use the box for feeding, winter preps. Okay, so because I have flow hives, um, I have done experiments where I left the boxes on with the flow supers and the flow frames on through the year right through winter, and that was without a queen excluder. And the reason was, I wanted to see if the bees would migrate up into the flow frames and not only use the honey there, but if the queen could actually lay eggs in it. Now some people commented right away on that video, said, oh, way to go, you know, you used a flow hive in a way they told you not to, and of course it's messed up. Okay, <laughs> let me explain what I do on my channel. I study honeybee behavior. So I do things that manufacturers of products may not recommend, and the reason I do that is to observe the honeybees. What's the damage to the honeybee if I allowed it to go up into the flow frames, and if I allowed the queen to lay eggs in those flow frames in order to determine whether or not that's even possible? Those frames are deeper, they're a little bit larger, and uh, it's unlikely that a queen would lay eggs, but guess what? She did. And then, so what's the problem there? Is it ruined? No, it's not ruined. In the spring, they will start to migrate down through the hive again, and they'll start using the old frames for their brood area, and then the upper frames will be restored to uh, honey production. So that's what I did. It was a test. Three colonies were left with total access to the flow supers. Only one of those three actually used the flow frames to lay eggs and have brood, and now that's being used for honey production, and it functions fine. So. That was not some terrible thing I did to the bees. It was something that I did in order to determine if it's possible and if it is. What happens? Well, what happened was they used it, moved down, cleaned it out, and now it's restored to full service, and those frames are still working fine. Now, what I do today to make sure that uh, the bees don't use those flow supers in the wintertime is after that last September, October harvest, when you still have resources in the environment, uh, after you draw off the honey from your flow frames, then you have two options. One is to pull the whole flow super off and remove it to another location so that the bees can clean it up, because that's what I like to do. I like to let the bees clean those frames out on their own, and that's what they've done. Now then I can put that box back on and use it as a placeholder with a feeder inside, and that's fine too, but in the spring you're gonna have to get in there quick and restore those frames. Or you just leave the whole box off, leave a medium super on full of honeycomb so that the bees have something to carry them through winter. So here's, here's the practice. Have your brood box, have a medium super with honey, remove the flow super for winter, and then just put the inner cover and the hive cover on that and get them through winter. And then in spring, when your bees are doing great and there's a nectar flow on and they're starting to fill up their resources again, you restore that flow super to your strongest colony so that they will fill those frames. Those are my winter preps. I don't do anything else for winter. I don't wrap my hives. Most of the hive landing boards are facing south. Uh, they're just in well-constructed boxes. I also let the bees propolize everything and seal up their little drafty areas. I don't pull apart all the brood frames just before winter because they have all that connected honeycomb in there where they've controlled how they want the airflow to go and so that the cluster can survive winter. And that's what I leave on. Those are my winter preps, nothing else. I don't wrap them. Uh, they are in a fairly shielded area as far as wind goes. And I have an anemometer out there that tells me what the wind speed is in the vicinity of my apiary. And uh, that's it. Uh, this year, the only thing I changed was uh, I took away the upper entrances for all my highs for winter. So now all they have are the lower entrance landing boards for this winter. So that's it. Winter preps for flow hives, no different. Uh, number four, electric fence around your hives. Okay. 
I've been keeping bees for a long time, and last year was the first time I ever had a bear come and visit my honeybee apiary. So, did it destroy the entire apiary? Nope. But what it did do is it went after some of my unoccupied hives that were set out there as a cleaning station. And it turned to some of those and took one way out into a field, but because he did get something, even though it was old cone that wasn't uh, of any real value to the bear, I knew he could come back. So this year I put up an electric fence. Now one of the things I did when I was studying honeybees before I ever had my own, I was doing photography and video of honeybees and their situation when we were talking about colony collapse disorder, I got to see the damage that bears do and I got to see the way people set up their apiaries and the protective measures that they put out. Now the electric fence, I use immediate temporary poultry netting because I'm also uh, someone who raises free range poultry and we put up electric fencing for them. Uh, I put that up as a temporary precaution because I knew the bear would be back and it did come back and it did not go into the apiary. So that was good news. But one thing you wanna do when you're thinking about where to put your electric fence, I noticed that some people seem to act like they really don't have much space around their apiary. Maybe that's true. But if you have space around where you're keeping your beehives, there's no reason to run your electric fence within a couple of feet of the hives themselves. Because here's what's happening. The bear is downwind and they're smelling your hives and they're finding that location and they approach it. And you could probably do a pretty quick search and find people that have video of black bears in particular getting right up next to their hives, testing the fence. They can actually hear the clicking of your solar power system because mine is solar powered for my electric fence and it makes a click sign. They have actually hit on that and strike it until they stop hearing the click and then these bears know that they can get in. The closer the bear is to those hives and the more he's worked up or she's worked up trying to get to the resources in those hive bodies, the less effective that electric fence is gonna be. So my thinking is make sure that electric fence, my electric fence was 40 or 50 feet from the beehives and still encompassing the entire area. Why? Because I want that bear to get shocked and educated by that electric fence before it is so close to the food resource that it actually starts to lose its judgment a little bit. If it gets close to the bees, it starts realizing that it can get those bees and they're smelling it and they're really after the brood. That's what they, you know, they tear apart stumps in the woods and everything for that. They'll even go after ants. So if you can educate them before they're all worked up and really close to it, you're actually gonna have a much, much better uh, protective measure in an electric fence. Some bears talking to other apiary owners have gone right through a fence. And I like to go and look it over to see what the damage is and how they did what they did. And inevitably that electric fence was within just a few feet of those hives. So I recommend, if you don't already have an electric fence set up around your apiary, that you run those strands in that fence several feet away from your apiary. Uh, the more of a protective zone that you can make around that apiary, the better. So that's all I can say about that. Also, I recommend you don't use the solar ones. If your apiary is close enough to a building that you have household current, 120 volt, then I suggest that you get the necessary equipment hook up to that and run it off household power because you don't want to have a whole bunch of cloudy days and rain and everything else and that reduce your electric fence, electric fence effectiveness. So that's it. And I've been doing that since last year and no bear has gone through it. Mineral water. Oh, water quality. So what kind of water do you give your bees? Well, there are a lot of things that we learned last year. And uh, I've done water testing before to see what kind of water the bees would prefer. And there are YouTube videos uh, supporting everything that I'm about to share with you today. So the uh, water quality, we have a pure filter, P-U-R, which is something we use in our house. So I put that in a quart drinker and I put out uh, well water, pond water, swimming pool chlorinated water. And we did a test to see what the bees would go to most often. So then we found out that they did prefer the pure water okay, over others. It didn't mean they didn't use any of the others, they did. They just didn't use it as much. So what that led to was do bees like salt? So then we did a salt test and I just used regular table iodized Morton salt. And I put that at one teaspoon, two teaspoons, three teaspoons, and so on per quart. 
until we figured out, number one, if they would even go for salty water, and then number two, what the salinity level would be that they would go after, and they showed a preference for one teaspoon per quart of salted water. So then someone kept saying, and thank you, uh, YouTube viewers, uh, someone kept saying, hey, Mr. Dunn, check out uh, sea salts and check out uh, pink Himalayan sea salts and Celtic sea salts. Everybody had a suggestion about what kind of sea salt to use. So, of course, I went to Amazon and I ordered four or five different varieties of sea salts. And then so we did at the one teaspoon per quart of fresh water, we added sea salts from a lot of different varieties. And guess what we discovered? Uh, that the bees are after minerals like crazy. So if we put in sea salts that have, in some cases, they, they boast 18 different minerals and others have 20 or 30 different minerals uh, listed in the package contents, it, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that it's mineral-laden sea salt water that the bees go after. And someone else on YouTube said that they use it to cure their honey. Okay, and I don't know about that. When people say things like that, I launch my own kind of inspection on that. I, I search around and try to find out how does salt water help bees cure honey. I don't know. If you know, please put that down in the uh, comments section of this video because I'd like to follow up more on that, but I couldn't find any science. One thing we do know for sure is they go after those minerals. So now I have a permanent mineral water station that uh, the sea salts that they chose the most were Morton sea salts, and of course those Himalayan, pink Himalayan salts. So I have a static station that has that available all the time, and there's constantly bees going for that. And what that has done is reduce their need for mineral water from local pools, bird baths, ponds, and puddles. And yes, even after a rainy day, you'll see them. We have dairy farms around here. And there'll be puddles where the cow manure is, and you'll see honeybees on those puddles. Why? Because it's mineral rich. So if you provide that mineral water, pure filtered water first, sea salts added, and then make that available seven days a week, 24 hours a day, the bees find it and use it routinely, and it does improve their health and vigor. So that's something that was really interesting that we discovered and are now using full time. Is it too cold for flow hives? Now, see, that's kind of an abstract question. Is it too cold for flow hives? Do they mean materially? In other words, does the plastic break down in the cold and become brittle and not work? That end of it is kind of non-relevant because we really don't use them in winter, and if they're left in place in winter, they don't get cycled, so there's no stress on it. I will say that the Andersons appear to have done extensive destructive tests on the flow frame components because they had kind of a documentary video showing how they were developing it, and they, they had these pull tests, so that's a tensile strength test, they were doing shear tests, and everything else to test that material, which is a food grade plastic, before they use it in the composition of those flow frames. So the frames that themselves, by the way, uh, are not showing that they're fragile, or that they would break or something, whether they're cold or warm. So on that end, no problem. So the other way that I might take this question is, if I'm in a colder climate, is it not good for flow hives? Well, that depends on honeybee production. That depends on honeybee numbers and how long your season is. If you have piles of forage around where you live, like I do, uh, my bees fill those flow frames. So they work for me and I'm in, the, I'm in the snow belt. It gets really cold here. It gets down into the single digits. We get high winds. We have a long winter and uh, they work here. Now, farther north, if you're in Alaska or something, or uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan or something like that, and uh, the, the resource gathering time for the bees is very narrow, I would say that your success rate with any honey production is going to be much reduced. So that's not necessarily specific to flow frames, but rather a general um, observation based on their honey production overall. So wherever honey production is high, flow frames would work. Wherever honey production is low or moderate, uh, they may never get to them, they may never fill them. Particularly if you're doing it the way I do, where you have the brood box, a medium super that has to be filled first. In some areas that medium super gets topped off and that's it, the bees are done, they've done everything they can. So adding a flow super to that would not work. It wouldn't be beneficial, there just isn't enough nectar to go around. Number six, do I prep my flow frames? The flow hive questions are pretty interesting. So flow frames are made out of a food grade plastic, and I don't know if, if you haven't seen it, 
Please do a search and watch the video. My very first one shows in great detail exactly how the mechanism works, the gaps that are in it, and everything else. So, do I prep them? I don't. I've seen people actually get a roller of hot melted beeswax and roll it across the face of the flow frames. Maybe that encourages them to use them faster. I don't know. Uh, for me and all the flow supers and all the flow frames that I've used, I've never done any prep. I haven't uh, sprayed them with sugar water. I have not uh, primed them with any kind of beeswax. I just put them on there and let the bees explore the area and start to condition the area the way they would any other part of their hive. So I personally don't do any prep. If you find someone that is putting wax or priming them that way, maybe go to that YouTube video and, and ask them, did that accelerate it? And it's always important when you do something like that, if you're going to prep frames, to have unprepped and prepped frames, even within the same super, so that side by side you can see, wow, the bees are really going for the, for the prepped primed frames faster than the unprimed or unprepared frames. You always have to have a comparison to make your observations you know, more grounded in actual preferences that the bees show. And uh, you just need to know more than just having one and knowing whether that worked or didn't, while another one isn't around to compare to. So comparison is really important. What do you do for year-round food for your bees? Okay, that's something this year that uh, we've really expanded on. Uh, you look at the environment and you look at what the bees are getting and when. We are in January right now, so I know that by you know later in the month of February, uh, people will be putting pollen patties and things like that on their hives. I never do that personally uh, because when I go out there and look at the landing board, if they can fly, if we have those intermediate warm days where they break cluster and start getting rid of the dead bees and they start flying out, they're actually bringing in pollen right away. Last year we spent a lot of time, my wife and I wandered around our property and uh, we live in the edge of wetlands, the woods, meadows, we have a lot of variety here and we found those bees on the um, wetland willow trees. So the willow trees had big, bold catkins that really stand out because everything else is leafless that time of year. And uh, it was easy to spot that and then you could actually hear the bees on them before you could see them. So that was exciting because other people were saying the first thing they're going to go for would be maple and they named other trees. But what they really were on first in my area was um, the catkins on those uh, willow trees. So then that led me again to an online arbor search and I found out Salix discolor, which is another willow variety that is loaded with pollen like that. And uh, I went to a garden center and I bought some online and had them shipped in because I wanted to compare the different species and how well the bees take to them. So uh, I planted an entire hedge around uh, the whole uh, upwind side of my apiary. So we put six plants in there that uh, this will be the first spring coming that we're going to see if the bees go straight to those. But what that does is provide an early pollen resource right away. The next thing is uh, when you're thinking about plantings, remember that your impact, unless you have huge amounts of land, is going to be kind of minimal, but every little bit helps. So we're looking for plants that bridge dearth periods. So where I live, um, white clover, for example, is available throughout the year, so the bees are constantly getting resources off of that. And of course, I try to influence all of my neighbors and Facebook friends and things like that not to kill off clover, not to kill off dandelions, uh, but to leave those resources, especially people that have these 100-acre fields that are not being used or they have cattle on them or something, but when they go to crops, they tend to kill everything off. So the more diversity that carries you through those dearth periods, the more sustained your bees are going to be. And uh, the other thing that I added this year were Maximilian sunflowers, and I also did a YouTube about that, foraging bees. And the Maximilians actually carried them farther into the fall than they otherwise would have, and those things are loaded with nectar and pollen. So look that up. The other thing is, there's a tree variety that I've overlooked. Since I've been here, I planted almost 300 trees. So, um, but last year again, through my research, I wanted to find trees that would bridge that uh, time when other trees were no longer in bloom, where other plants were no longer in bloom, and I came up with the um, Little Leaf Linden. 
So we planted three varieties of linden trees in a field. And uh, that's something that not a lot of people are talking about, and I wish they would. Look up linden trees as a pollinator tree. Because one adult linden tree, you're gonna, somebody's going to put in the comments, it's just not true, but I'm telling you, check it out. One adult linden tree produces on average 1,200 pounds of nectar. One tree. So people that are on smaller plots and are looking for things to plant that will benefit bees and pollinators in general, a linden tree is way up the food chain as far as providing resources for pollinators and honeybees. So linden trees, we put those out there. So that's what we added this year. Maximilian's at the end of the season. Linden trees are going to bridge that late June into July period, and they're going to be providing for them. And uh, so now we've cut way down on that dearth period. And this year we're also planting two acres of uh, wildflowers, uh, native wildflower varieties. So all of these things together are going to boost the health and well-being of the bees, the mineral water, the food resources in the environment, and the water quality that we're providing for them. So that's year-round food for bees, of course, when they're in their hives this time of year. Uh, nothing's coming from the environment for them. And they can't get out to glean that anyway. So, why do you keep bees? Do you keep it for honey, pollination, wax? I keep bees because when Silence of the Bees came out as a documentary, I started paying attention to the honeybees and the colony collapse disorder that was being talked about. And uh, I went looking for bees. And as a photographer and a videographer, I covered acres of land and could not find a honeybee. And that struck me. So I contacted our Department of Agriculture for my state. I volunteered my photographic services to go and photograph different conditions for the bees. And I also got to meet our state inspector. Our state inspector from the Department of Agriculture was the single greatest influence in my decision to buy and own my own bees. And that's because every time he and I got together and I was all excited about the bees and I wanted to photograph them and learn more, he said, you know, Fred, you really need to just buy your own bees. In fact, get at least two colonies. And that will lead me to another question down here, how many colonies to start out with. But key is the reason I got my own bees because it just seemed so obvious. Get your own bees, have them close by, and then I can study their behavior. So that's what I do. I study honeybee behavior, I photograph honeybees, and I make video documentary sequences of honeybees that get used all over the place. There are grad students at Cornell Department of Entomology that have used my uh, bee sequences and audio collections for their master's programs. There are people making bee documentary movies that contact me and I let them use my sequences case by case, depending on you know if I like the idea of the documentary that they're doing. And uh, that's what I do. I study bee behavior. Why do I have an observation hive? I have an observation hive so I can get in there and with macro equipment, get close and in-depth observations of honeybee behavior, and that has been so rewarding. Now, uh, are they earning income for me? No. So, I've made a lot of cool friends, and I've uh, been invited to talk about bees and give presentations about bees, and uh, I enjoy doing that. So, the reason that I keep bees is to learn about them, to be honest. And then, of course, uh, after that, to share what I know. So like my YouTube uh, bee videos go back to 2008. And that's really when I started realizing, wow, YouTube can be used to inform the public about bees. I did not realize that people would be watching these videos around the world. And that has basically closed the gap uh, in our ability to learn from one another and communicate about bees. And that's what I do. I raise bees, I learn about them, uh, bought the Flow Hive, and I think I'm gonna com com comment about that later on here. But uh, it's just led me in so many different directions that I did not expect. And that's why I raise bees to learn about bees and observe them. And then, of course, provide for them as best I can in my region. Number nine, how long will the flow hive frames last? Million dollar question right there. I have had flow frames in use for four years. So we cycle and harvest from the flow frames, each one probably three times out of the year. And that's a lot. Uh, some people get maybe one harvest a year where I live in, in my region. So when are they going to wear out? I you know, honestly can't even tell you. I'm going to guess that the, the wooden wear is going to wear out and require replacement before those uh, food-grade plastic frames do on their own. They're a tough material. 
uh, the way they activate, there are big gaps in between the pieces. In fact, we were just talking about this last night with another person that's starting out with bees. And uh, because they have propolis and wax connecting and sealing them up, when you cycle them, that propolis and wax is also the lubricant uh, when they're moving. So it's not like these components are wearing down. So what else could wear them out? Well, the bees could chew them. Bees chew wood, if you've ever seen the inside of a hive and seen the edges rounded off and stuff. So it's a lot of work for them to chew things, but they could wear things down. So I do take them out and look at them to see if I can see any physical, you know, wear and tear. But what happens is on the ends of the cells, they have that layer of wax and they're not chewing that away to get to the plastic. So the plastic itself, the understructure, the skeleton of the mechanism is not showing any signs of wear. Now, as with any other plastic, what would break it down? High heat, for one. If you can smell plastic, you ever get in your car on a super hot summer day and you can just smell the plastic from the dash and all the things in there, your plastic's destabilizing. If you can smell it, the particulates are in the air. It's degrading. Uh, if you put things out in bright sunlight, the ultraviolet light is gonna act on the plastic and eventually discolor it and break it down. It becomes brittle and useless. Flow frames are never exposed to the sun. And so they're not exposed to the things that would destroy the plastics or break it down or cause it to liberate itself into honey suspension, for example. It's not on my list here, but I get lots of, they're not so much questions. I get comments on my YouTubes where somebody will get in there and say, plastic's bad for people, it's bad for the bees, it's in that honey, that honey's full of plastic and everything else. Okay, let's just clear it up really quick. There is zero evidence from any testing lab in this country that honey in contact with flow frames, the food grade plastic in flow frames, there is no evidence to date that any bit of that plastic makes its way into your honey, period. And the very second a lab shows up with a positive test of microplastics in that honey, I'll be the first to share it with you on YouTube because that's something I'm constantly looking into and constantly want to know about. People, you know, it's like they want to be against the flow hive and they want it to fail. I, you know, I don't know why. Um, it's just a new tool in beekeeping and either it works or it doesn't. But it's almost like they speculate so strongly that they speculate as if they know for sure that that's what's happened. There is zero evidence that plastic is leaching into your honey. The same people that are putting plastic foundations on their bee frames uh, they don't seem worried about it then and the same people that run it through plastic filters and then they run their honey and store it in plastic bins they don't seem concerned about the honey in contact with all of those plastic components but somehow because it's part of a flow hive that plastic is bad detrimental dangerous to bees it isn't if it's ever determined to be dangerous or if those particulates get into the honey I'm going to share that. I think you guys know, if you've watched even my first Flow Hive uh, video, you know that if there's something wrong with it, I'm going to talk about it and share about it. That's why I'm here. So, next thing, how long will it? So the flow frames, they last, we don't know. Four years for sure. Uh, the upper entrance, with or without a queen excluder. Okay, here's the thing. I get in conflict with people on this. I don't know why because I'm a non-conflict kind of person. I just share information, I'm not dictating. You'll never have me tell you what you have to do. I'm sharing what I do. So when it comes to queen excluders, first of all, I don't use queen excluders. Then somebody would say, but you definitely told us to use queen excluders. Yes, I told you to. And that's because if you're new to your bees and you're not sure how bees behave during different seasons through the year, you're gonna want your queen excluder in. Because if you, for example, don't wait for your bees to settle themselves into your brood frames and you provide a bunch of different areas and you expand that hive ahead of time, they could be, you could have a queen that starts laying brood all over the place. That's not the normal pattern, but it could happen. So if you're going to fail safe, you're going to put your flow frames in there. Where did I get my flow frames? That's not what I mean. Your queen excluder. Where did I get my idea uh, not to use uh, queen excluders? Well, many years ago, I paid attention to Dr. Delaplane for the University of Georgia. He's their chief entomologist there. I don't know what Dr. Delaplane does today, 
But uh, he was the one that I saw not using queen excluders, and that was because it slowed honey production. That made perfect sense. But being me, that led me to do other tests with you know, queen excluders, and so I had a big open feeding station, and I put a queen excluder on top of it. And I was noticing bees having difficulty even getting through those. There's another guy on YouTube called Don the Fat Bee Man. You need to check him out. He talks about queen excluders too. I'm not alone in suggesting that queen excluders wear out your bees earlier, the workers, and they slow honey production. In fact, some of the workers can't even get through it and they give up. So then that leads to the next part of this question here, uh, the upper entrance. So during the summer, my hives have a three quarter inch upper entrance hole, usually in the top shallow super. And the reason for that is the bees come and go freely from those uh, honey supers and it speeds things up. Uh, even if I don't have a queen excluder down below, I have equal numbers of bees heading in through the landing board as I do coming in through the uh, top entrance. So what that does is, is we've just accelerated their access to and from those uh, honey supers there. Now, you should have a, you know, if you, the thing with bees is once the queen sets up in those uh, brood frames and she's laying and they have the pattern and the bees are all attending her and the nurse bees are there and they're taking care of those bees. Then what they're doing is they're starting around the, the periphery of that. They're building up their resources. So that's where you're going to see lots of pollen packs and you're going to start to see the honey cells filling. And then so that medium super that I put on gets filled with honey. And so upon inspection, when you look at that, it's all honey. It's nothing but honey. The chances of that queen bee crossing over that honey and then laying her eggs up above it are almost zero. So that's when you can put on your flow supers above that. And the bees are going to put honey in there and the queen's not even going to go that far to lay her eggs. So if you've learned, that's why I say new people, yes, put your queen excluder in there. You have to understand too that in the, in the flow hives where they live, and if you look at their setup, it's a, a deep box for brood and then it's immediate, it's the flow super. So they better put a queen excluder in that because there is no bridge area of nothing but honey. But the way I do it, deep box, at least one medium, then the flow super. They're not gonna cross that uh, solid honey frame to go up and lay eggs and start a whole new zone, okay, of brood. So that's why I don't use queen excluders. But it's also why I suggest that you, starting out, do until you realize when and how that happens and you understand the patterns through the year of your uh, honeybee colony. Personal protective clothing. Somebody said I need to suggest that. Uh, a lot of all-time beekeepers. Well, um, I did a whole thing on personal protective clothing. There's a YouTube about it that I go over everything from just a veil all the way through full protective suits. I have everything. I sit out there for hours with nothing but, you know, a hat on. Sometimes just, you know, I'm not wearing anything but a cup of coffee. But I have everything else. I have full suits. I have maximum protection suits because I do other things. I video and I take photos of things that will sting you that are after you, things besides honeybees. So I'm equipped, but if you're new to beekeeping and your confidence is not up, don't go out there in just a t-shirt and baggy shorts and uh, learn about your bees that way. That's just my suggestion, okay? I'm not saying don't like, you know, if you go out there, you're an idiot if you're in a full suit or likewise, you're an idiot if you're not. It's personal preference, but you're not going to be able to reverse gears very well if you've gone out there with no protection and you forget to smoke your bees and you just open it sometime because that happens to people. You know, they're just out there, they get curious about something, they start pulling their beehive apart. Next thing you know, they realize they forgot to smoke the bees. So, until your confidence is up, just have a full bee suit. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of companies, I've tested bee suits from everybody that makes bee suits. Um, the maximum protection suits are fantastic. You know, uh, there are ventilated suits. A lot of different companies have strong points in their suits that are not across the board. There's like the best ventilated suit, there's the best maximum protection suit, there are lightweight suits, uh, 
you know, is something that you're just going to want to be comfortable in, but you want to be comfortable around your bees and you want to be protected. After you've become protected and confident, then start shedding bits of your suit until you realize you understand your bees and what their behavior is. The other thing is the type of veil that you get. How close is that thing to your face? Some people, it always amazes me when somebody's got a full bee suit on and they go, man, I got stung right on the nose or right on the lip or right on the cheek. I don't, they, you know, they're working and they lean forward. They push their face right up against that uh, veil. So I would suggest uh, when you get your bee suit, see how far out the veil goes. Those uh, Buttfest Abbey uh, veils are really, they're round and they stick way out. Probably a good starter because that way everything's well away from your face. Uh, terrible feeling too. If you think you're all zipped up and sealed up and there's a bee flying around right here and, and you think, uh, wow, why, why won't it go away? Then you realize that thing's on the inside of your suit. Don't panic. So just go somewhere else, take the bee suit off and get that bee out of there. Uh, there were a lot of times early on when I was out working with the bees and I'd be back inside, would have been inside for like an hour and I'm sitting at the computer typing something up and uh, I feel something moving on under my pant leg and it's a honeybee. So wear protection, be aware of where the bees are going. You don't want a bad situation. Or when it comes to little children in particular, um, unless, you know, that's a judgment call. You want uh, little kids to be protected because you never know when the bees are suddenly going to have a change of attitude. You want to be ready for that. Okay, locating bees. I think by that question, um, locating bees is where to put your beehives. Me personally, you want to put it in an area where the ground is not damp all the time. You do not want to put your beehives just like your chicken coops. You don't want to put them right where the tree line meets an open field. Everything that hunts and scavenges uh, goes along the tree line. You want your beehives in the open somewhere. You want them to be also sheltered from wind. So when it comes to, so once you create your spot for your apiary and hopefully there's a break. So like here where I live, we have continuous forests everywhere and we have every kind of wildlife there is. So if I had put my beehives in the woods, they'd just be gone. So having them out in the open. The other thing is put hedges, you know, around your bees and uh, kind of protect them. Protect them from the wind, prevailing wind. So you can set up a fence system. Um, you can do all kinds of things to protect your bees, but locate them so that their landing boards face south if you're in the northern climate. So that on those days like today, it's, you know, in the single digits and 10s and 12s, uh, we still had nice sunshine, so the south-facing hives warmed up a little bit and they were doing cleansing flights out into the snow. And some of the ones that went out in the snow actually did their thing. They eliminated and then they got the energy to fly back and make it back into the hive. That was kind of unexpected. Usually on a day like today, it's a one-way trip. But so locating your hives in a place and a place where you can see them, that's the other thing. There's some people that have property on the country. They don't even live there and they'll just go set their hives out there. Uh, they kind of overestimate how much time they're going to have to go out and visit them. I recommend, as I do, my hives are, you know, within 80 feet of where I'm standing right now. So even on a coffee break, I can go out and check up on them and see what's going on. Early in the morning, I can go out and see if they were visited by a predator. I also have surveillance cameras on my beehives because I want to see anything that comes and goes there. Because if a bear comes through and destroys everything, I'm going to get a sweet YouTube out of it at least. If I'm going to lose everything, at least I'm going to be able to share with you the failure. So locate your bees where they're accessible, where they're high and dry, and uh, facing south if you're in a northern climate or wherever. You know, shelter them from prevailing winds in an area that you will frequently go to. How many hives? That's a good question. If you're starting out, how many beehives should you have? Again, I'm going to go back to the state inspector. When he was talking to me about starting my own hives, and he said, don't just get one, Fred, get two. Uh, that's wise advice. Do you know why? If you only have one hive of bees, and you think they're either doing great or they're not doing great, you have nothing to compare that to. So, you want at least two colonies. Um, let me add something to that. When I first got the Flow Hive from the Indiegogo campaign, and uh, I did that video about it, and then I went out and I put that in my apiary the first year, and I chose a beehive, and I put it on that one beehive, 
they did nothing. They didn't touch the flow frames. They didn't go up in there at all. So um, the thing there was, if I'd only had one colony to test that out on, you know what my decision would have been about that flow super? That it just doesn't work. That I spent a lot of money, the bees didn't use it, I didn't get honey out of it, and it just didn't work. So then what I did was, I took that flow super and I put it on another colony. The colonies appeared to be of equal strength. Now what happened was, that colony went straight to work on it and filled it up with honey. So what I had was one colony of bees that really didn't respond to it and didn't use the space. Well, another colony did, and then I bought two more flow supers and I put those on other hives. So I started to move them around to the bees that used them first. But then the bonus was, once they'd been used and cycled once, and I take it back to that first hive that didn't do anything with them, once they're used by bees and you put them on that colony, then those bees use them too right away. They just started moving in and storing stuff. So I don't know if the other bees after they used it and the honey was extracted, if uh, they left enzymes or, you know, there's pheromone there that made them think that it's okay, it's used by bees because they're not from the same colony. Uh, all the flow supers work now in all of my hives. And as of this year, 2019, every hive in my apiary will be a flow hive. So, absolutely work. Start with at least two hives so that you can make comparisons about their success. Edible apiary hedge. Okay. Now, around my apiary, I have some... Um, blue spruce and things like that that provide shelter from wind and everything and even shade. And I've what I've done is I've taken each spruce tree and tucked a beehive in it. And that speeds up those bees finding their hive and it's also somewhat sheltered. The other thing is uh, I realize if I'm planting a hedge around my apiary, why would I plant anything for a hedge that is not edible or beneficial to the bees? I mean, plants are plants. So that's why I went with those Salix discolor, uh, those early pollen sources for my bees. I've begun to create my hedge around my apiary out of that because that's going to be an edible windbreak. So if you haven't planted around your apiary yet and you're kind of thinking, well, I want to cut down on the wind and, you know, I want it to be pretty and, you know, I want it to be a place that I want to go and sit and stuff and I want it to benefit the bees. This is your time where you can make a decision about planting plants that the bees can actually use for food. So you're going to plant a hedge anyway. Don't, uh, yeah, evergreens are cool because they're also habitat for birds and things like that. And those trees are going to be huge. So um, plant edible hedges, crab apples, dwarf crabs, things like that. You can even plant blueberries and things like that. So those are all things that are going to produce for wildlife and provide a windbreak and uh, protection, even visual protection, if you're just trying to hide your apiary too so that people can't see it from a distance. Edible fringe around your apiary. Do bees like flow frames to store honey? What's your experience? Okay, I've kind of answered that already. Bees don't like or dislike the frames or places that they're gonna put their honey. And that question, by the way, was just asked today. And uh, I told that guy on YouTube in response to his question, uh, I'm doing a Q&A today for YouTube and it will launch later and you'll get your answer there. So bees don't like or dislike flow frames any more than they like or dislike acorn frames, which I also use, or wooden frames or foundation frames. Anything that, that you happen to use, it's not whether they like or dislike it, it's just whether they use it or don't. So when it comes to flow frames, yeah, they use it. Uh, as I mentioned before, if I only had one colony and one flow super on it, I would only know, I would either say it was awesome if they used it, or I would say it didn't work that well, or at all, if they didn't. But uh, it's been my experience um, that they're using it, that it works great. I've done several videos showing that. Uh, uh, the proof is just in the, in the way they use it. And I'm voting with my dollars. I am going to have my entire apiary flow supers and flow frames and flow hives. So they absolutely work. And I've been doing flow hives for four years now. So that's my experience, they work. And then the last question, mouse guard or trap? Okay. Now this is something, by the way, that I've been paying attention to also is mice. We have deer mice where I live. 
We also have shrews and we have the regular house mice, which are all gray. So they periodically do get into beehives. They don't go into all of my beehives. But when I find mouse nest material in the beehive, uh, I set traps and trap out the mice. So you might say, well, why don't you just put a, you know, a mouse guard on the front of it? Some people use half inch hardware cloth and they put that across the front or they put a mouse guard on there and it's got the little, either the little holes or it's got the little arches that keep the mice from going in. Here's what happens in winter time for me. And it's something I was doing today too, is cleaning out the dead bees. The hives going into winter, after your first big winter storm, if you're in the north again, this may not apply to you in the south where the bees are coming and going all the time and you just want to eliminate mice in your hive, but in the north where we have a die-off, there will be dead bees piling up on the bottom board of your hive. And then when you get a warm day, they're going to fly out their dead. So you'll see them just flying out and dropping them in the snow. If you have a mouse guard there, you run the risk of the mice, not the mice, but you run the risk of the dead bees piling up against that mouse guard, and then uh, there's no exit point for your bees. So that's kind of a nightmare. And then you think, well, I'll just go out there and I'll pull the mouse guard off from time to time and I'll, I'll clear those out and then I'll put the mouse guard back. No reason to trap the mice, okay? Well, you might mean well and you might think you're going to do that. What ends up happening is you end up with a bunch of trapped bees uh, with a bunch of dead bee bodies on the bottom. And again, I'm speaking specifically about northern climates. Down in the south, again, you may not have this big winter die off, but where I live, you go into the fall and the first big winter storm that happens, those summer bees that are residual bees that are still inside your colony, along with those that are going to winter over, they begin to die out and they, because they can't fly and they can't get out, they're just dying on the bottom. And normally, the workers would fly those out. But with a mouse guard in place, that is extremely difficult for them to do. And they just can't fly them out. So I set traps for the mice, and I trap them out. And that's only when I find out that there is a hive that's being visited by mice. How do I know that? Because I put security cameras out there that are motion activated. And I also put trail cameras out there so I can see... If they're facing the hives, you put that thing on maximum sensitivity and set it on night mode only, you'll see which hives are being visited by mice, and then you can decide whether you want to trap that mouse or whether you think you have to put a mouse guard on there. I don't put mouse guards on because just like today, I went out there and I used chopsticks and I sweep out the dead bees. Um, sometimes you just can't get out there, and if there's a mouse guard preventing your bees from coming and going, they can't do their own clean out either. So you just might be trapping your bees with a mouse guard. So the other observation I made was the Flow Hive 2. I'm sorry to talk about Flow Hive so much, but it is an area that I'm constantly evaluating. The Flow Hive 2 has a, a narrow landing board entrance, and there's an aluminum piece that lays across the bottom. The mice and voles and shrews aren't even trying to get in there. So that was very interesting, uh, that it's too small for them. Where a normal Langstroth landing board has a nice deep opening and you've got an entrance reducer on there, uh, the mice actually squeeze into those if they really want to get in there and it's always the younger mice. So they're going to get in there and they're going to eat, they might even eat dead bees. I don't know what they're eating in there because they don't have a camera inside. But I can see what they're visiting and what they're not and they're not even attempting to get into the Flow Hive 2s anymore. So the other Langstroth bottom boards and stuff, they do come and go periodically and they have what I call a tiger hive which is out tucked into a uh, blue spruce tree. That was the most visited, and then I trapped out all those mice, and then there are no mice coming to that anymore. So we're already, you know, we're in January, and the mice problem is, is done. So that's it. Those are all my questions. Let me know if you found this video helpful at all, because I can certainly do more of these. I don't have to go into bee yard and make observations and make bee videos to, um, to share with you. We can just share knowledge. So if you have questions, please put them down in the, in the questions beneath the video. And then when I see more, you know, thumbs up tags on the questions that rise to the top, those will be the ones that uh, I'll readdress or give more information about what I've covered today. Or we can also uh, add stuff and I'll be happy to talk about anything you want to learn about in the future here. So if this works and this is a good format, let me know. And then uh, again, add your new questions down below. And the more that people click on those, 
you know, we'll take the top 10 next time and we'll address those. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to my channel if you want to and if you want to see more. I appreciate that you're here watching this today. Thanks again.